Episode 20. I'm here with Chris Polgarin. Am I saying your last name right? Yeah, perfect. Polgarin. As always, I feel like I should start that before I start the episode. Is ask, how do I say your name? Yeah. <laughs> but, well, I mean, we'll my, my, my last name is a little bit tricky for people because uh, I'm Colombian. Hell yeah. So, I mean, technically, the way that you would say my last Please, name yeah. is Polgarin. Okay. But for everybody up here... Just say Pulgarin, it's fine. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> from Chile. My mom's from Chile, oh, uh, no, so I'm no half way. and half as well. Uh, so yeah, my last name should be Torgrosa Munoz. My mom actually has two last names as well, mm -hmm. and then we chopped one of them off. I'm hoping that's right, actually, as yeah. I say it out loud for the first time. Um, but yeah, so I feel you on the, eh, whatever's close yeah. enough, as even long as you're with, in the right ballpark. Yeah, with that, I even get confused, because it's like, there's like four last names. There's like, mm -hmm. Torgarin Torres, and then you there like, you go. Have like four more, and then you're like, I'm not doing all that. Yeah, and all the middle names. Too <laughs> that's too much work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be like cultured and like enough to keep it a part of me. I even like, shorten my first name half the time. Yeah. Just call me Chris. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want to say the whole thing. <laughs> That's funny. Um, hell yeah, dude. Something from everyone. Episode 20. Uh, 20 is a big milestone for me. So I started this like six months ago and I said 20 is my number of like, uh, I'm going to get to 20. No matter what, if I love it or hate it, I'm going to get to 20. And now we're at 20. I'm having fun. So it's an exciting like transition of like, oh, I got the beginner part out of the way. And now I've got more tech stuff coming in. So we were talking before about headphones or the next thing. So we Beautiful. can like monitor the audio. This is getting upgraded so we can have more people is my other big exciting thing to start and get bands on or more like than more, just two yeah. people. That'd be fun to hang out. Well, congratulations, um, dude. That's I awesome. I appreciate that, man. Um, and of course, you guys have been busy and successful and doing all the great things ever. Uh, so a couple of days ago, we had The Death We Seek came out. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, uh, obviously, the response has been electric, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But I want to go to like before the record drops. So it's two days before the record drops. Is that an exciting moment? Is it nerve wracking? Like, what are you feeling two days before the record drops? It's interesting because we've also sat on the record for so long, mm -hmm. you know, that you kind of, it's just, there's an eagerness for everybody to listen to it. Mm -hmm. And it's almost to the fact where it's almost to the point where hearing these songs, I'm like, these are basically like old to me now. Like I've heard them so many times and we're also, you know, like sending new songs to each other to write for the mm -hmm. next record to come out. Just, you know, it's one of those things is, I don't think any of us are sick of it or hate it. And we're still really hungry for it. And, you know, it's all exciting. It's a weird thing. I've seen the music videos of like, I'm working on this thing. And by the time it gets to the audience, like it's going to go through the band and then it has to go through distribution and all the other bullshit. And by the time it's live, I'm not excited. I'm already on to the next thing. On so it's this thing. weird like balance. Have you been able to like feel all the love? I feel like social media has been dominated. Like the whole state has lit up in support of the record. Oh, it's, it's, it's unreal. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of love that we've been able to get and stuff. Uh, it's, I, I don't know, man. It's, surreal yeah and uh i, I just appreciate it too because you know there, and there's a level of you know you go like i hope people like this mm -hmm. and just because you know there were so many years of grinding where nobody cared yeah like you know people see like where we're at now but sometimes forget the last decade mm -hmm. plus you know yes. it's been like a decade of currents but it's like Plus all of the shows that we played in front of nobody mm -hmm. and nobody cared. And, you know, you, we release things, you get excited and then and people are like, eh, and you're, you're like, okay, well on to the next thing. So it, I don't know if it's just kind of a learned thing mm -hmm. from all of those years of experience, but there's just kind of like, you know, cause I, I don't think it's healthy either to lean too much into the positivity either. It's just as much as it's unhealthy to lean into the negative yeah. aspects of thing. Like you could have a, a thousand people tell you you're the greatest, and then one person being like you suck, and you're yeah. just gonna be like my day is ruined. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's you can't really lean in. You just got to do your thing. My phrase is I'm always so bad at smelling the roses. So in the context of an album release, it's like I'm proud of these twelve ten songs. I believe mm -hmm. it's ten songs, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm bad at pausing and taking in the person saying, I love this record and really relating to that where I'm sure as you're alluding to, it's like, no, you saw some comment of someone who said, oh, blah, 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 little detail was just not, eh, whatever. For sure. And that's the one that somehow got into your head instead of the 90 comments or hundreds of comments saying, no, this was great. This was incredible. This was awesome. Yeah. Um, do you find like you're able to, yeah, the record's kind of been, the single's been out for a while. Like I feel like you guys are used to it by now. Have you been able to like appreciate the love from it or is it just like, like... 
you, I guess the, as you were saying, you put out so many records that don't go anywhere. It's like the majority of our records releases have no audience. That is what we are used to. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of years, you can look at the last Currents record and say, it did well. And I think this is in the same tune. And it seems like the next evolution of it. So in some sense, you know, it's going to go well, but you're conditioned of like, no, these never go well. This never does go well. For sure. To, to a point, uh, when we were recording, there was definitely a sense of, I feel like we're doing something special. Mm -hmm. uh, we all have been doing this together now for so long that the process of it is like butter. It's just so easy to do. Awesome. And like a lot of like when we're in the studio doing stuff with each other, it's just kind of like one of the things we'll do is like, we'll just try to make each other laugh. Like it's so ridiculous. And like the part is so cool that we just have to laugh and we're like, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know? And, uh, it, it just having fun with it and, you know, making, making things not get stale. Yeah. Are know? the five of you still in the studio together? I know you have the benefit of having Wiseman produce the record, mm -hmm. which is such a, a unique asset to someone in the band and also in the professional like top tier side of oh, mixing. Oh, for sure. He, um, he's an incredible asset to have and an incredible friend. And, but despite I mean, that, the five of you are still in the room together mm -hmm. and making music happen. Yeah. So like, you know, we'll all have like ideas at some point with things and Chris ends up writing like the, the bulk of like the music, but he's one of his, the reason why the final products come out so well with him is because he's so good at uh, working with others. And like, so he'll have a song that's like 90% done and he'll be like, what do you guys think? And then we'll come in and we'll be like, I like this idea or, you know, try to add a little bit of like this and that here, add a little bit more personality. Cause like, I'm sure it's like looking at a photo or a video, you edit for so long that you get lost in it and you're like, I need a fresh perspective, mm -hmm. you know, and his ability to not let his own ego get into the way and listen to our ideas to put them into the songs is what I think where he like shines. That's cool. It's a really interesting and nuanced uh, trait to be so good at. Uh, when you're writing the song, I assume there's a moment where you go, this is what Currents would have done on the last record. And the last record went well, but we kind of want to take a chance here. How do you balance those two of like, yeah, if you just put out a new record, that's a brand new sound every time that doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. Like there needs to be some cohesion and through line. Uh, but also if you're in the studio saying, well, this went well last time, let's just do that. Then mm -hmm. that's worth nothing as well. Well, there's definitely a sense of like, we have a blueprint, mm -hmm. but it's also growing as an artist. So you're only going to be able to create with whatever tools you have in your bag. So you can't create your, your abilities to create anything new are going to be limited if you aren't growing as an artist. And that comes from just practicing and just trying new things. And you're like, oh, okay, so I, I did this a lot, but like, let's try this now. Cause like, I've been, I learned a different song from another band and I thought this part was really cool and trying things like that. And then Chris also, uh, like experimenting with different tunings and, you know, we did a, we did two songs with six string guitars with, for the first time uh in current history <laughs> that's how it happened <laughs> and it's kind of crazy because i feel like they're two of like the heaviest so like some of the that's, heavier more technical like songs that's a really cool yeah. full circle moment yeah i would assume when currents is starting everyone is just getting to seven strings is kind of the new thing i'm sure yeah. eight strings has made its way in oh yeah uh, what two songs are they uh i think so alone and which other ones started to put you on the spot i'm so bad with song names so i'm always dreading someone asking me about the same yeah question. there's a uh, <laughs> I forget what the other one. I know It'll solo is definitely yeah. in, in the in the six string. Hell home. yeah! How is that as a as an instrumentalist? Like losing a string. With, I mean, I assume you're still. So using I that, still but... I prefer five string basses okay. over the four string, especially well, at least within like playing current songs. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially their songs with tapping and it's just really the spacing between the strings. Cause with a four string, sometimes like the spacing between mm -hmm. them will be like larger. And when I'm trying to do like a tapping part, my finger will just like miss the string and yeah, I just yeah. hit fretboard and I'm like, <laughs> and you're like, I, it's not what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. That's a weird problem as you, uh, yeah, as you have the new record come out, it also means a new batch of songs to learn. And of course it's, you guys are not writing songs that are easy to learn. I'm sure it's a, a nightmare process or at some point there's a song that Chris sends you and you go, I would love that, but. Oh yeah. Ow. Well, that, so that was one of, uh, when I, when I first joined the band. <laughs> what year was that? Or like So I, I first started playing with them. Uh, it was like end of 2018, early 2019. Oh, yeah. um, even though like I've 
you know, been friends with the band and been around with them since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But yeah, around that time, like I'd grown up playing in like post hardcore bands Mm -hmm. and like, you know, hardcore bands and it, getting the current's material was a little bit above my skill level. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I really put like a good poker face on. Like mm-hmm. when I first got the songs, like Chris sent me to them, I just I remember sitting there with my hands in my head, like yeah. in my yeah, yeah, yeah. my face in my hands, being like, "What am I gonna do?" Yep. And then, but it was kind of like one of those things where it's like, "All right, it's like let's level up and let's get mm-hmm. there," and kind of learning, like, you know having the skills that you had before and applying them to different things and like really getting into it. And it, it's really like, if you want it, like you'll do it. Yeah. And I put a lot of hours into like developing those skills. And there was, there were a lot of moments where I would be like, this is impossible. And I would, you know, sorry, D not to call <laughs> you out, but there would be like parts where, uh, I would be like, there, there's no way. Yeah. And I would watch like a live video and be like, oh, okay, I see like do you do a little mm-hmm. like a, a shortcut right there. Mm-hmm. And like and Matt would say the same thing about like Jeff, mm-hmm. you know, because like these these parts are, you know, very like they're not easy. Yeah. And, and we're not easy to play sitting down in a chair, much less on stage running around the way. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But for for whatever reason, I feel like I play better in front of the crowd. That's cool. It's just like the energy mm-hmm. really like I feel like I go like Super Saiyan. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Hell yeah. And um but so Chris uh would I would go to his house and he would just put like a click and record me playing the songs, which mm-hmm. was brutal yes oh god yeah you know, like you know chris and he'd be like hmm. <laughs> and yeah he knows everything yeah he'd yeah, be perfect, like oh, yeah. that was, and yeah. so like we we had we had to have the like this conversation and like i tried using that excuse of being like well d wasn't doing that and he's like yeah okay but you know if we're gonna have a new bass player i want him to be able to play these parts mm-hmm. and i said i can't argue that yeah you know so yeah. i again went deep into the songs and Mm -hmm. i was just like i you know even if i have to put these at like quarter of the tempo Mm -hmm. and just hammer them on for hours like Mm -hmm. i'm gonna learn this i love that i'm glad you said that because i think that's a part of the music that we never hear and i'm always enamored by the idea of producers writing stuff that is either hard to play or impossible to play i think drums are the ones where it's impossible sometimes they're like we just have enough limbs to do whatever the Mm -hmm. person wrote was when when guitar Um, players write drum parts yeah yeah yeah, not musical enough to really appreciate it but yeah i've heard the sentiment enough yeah Um, but i think is interesting is the more i've had that conversation the defining trait i've heard from people in your chair is uh, I didn't think it was possible, but I sat down and said, okay, well, it has to be somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that like resilience is a really interesting part that's kind of a central tie to a lot of our band friends that I'd never been aware of. And I think it makes sense that we are people who are just individually driven and willing to make it work. And uh, yeah, it's the same brain who thinks that a band can work. I mean, a band is a crazy gamble to pay off on, but 100%. yeah, the person who's willing to sit down with the instrument at quarter speed is the same person who can make that band work. I mean, it's just like anything... You know, uh, we like before we got into it. We, like, I'm a martial artist, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a book uh, that I like to read. It's called The Book of Five Rings. Mm-hmm. I've read it like a few times now, and mm-hmm. every time I read it, it like I learn something new from it. Cool. Okay. But one of the things that it uh, really like gets like one of the uh, ideas that it tries to like instill in you is uh, it's called the way, mm-hmm. and essentially. What it means is that when you see the way in something, you see it in everything. So when you master something and you have a skill, you can apply that. Like you don't have to master like everything and come at it it from a different way. You know what it takes and how to get from like a point, get to a point of efficiency in Mm -hmm. everything because you've mastered that one thing. So, you know, you are a master, you know, with your camera. If you wanted to learn how to play instruments, if you wanted to learn how to play the current songs, mm-hmm. you're not starting at a zero step. You yeah. know, be like, all right, this is going to be difficult, but I know how, like, you've put in the hours to know that, you know, I'm going to have to sit here, I'm going to have to do this, 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 and that, and I'm going to have to put in these hours of work to be able mm-hmm. to to make that happen. And uh, it, uh, you know... There's there's just so many uh, aspects in life uh, outside of just music and martial mm-hmm. arts and stuff that you could that you can apply those things to. 
it makes me laugh as a, as a kid when I'm always telling my dad that school is dumb and this whole thing is dumb and I'm in sixth grade or whatever. Uh, at some point, he, at some point, my parents finally conceded like, yeah, maybe geometry isn't the thing. Maybe the state capitals aren't everything. Yeah. But at some point, my dad hit me with like, well, you're learning how to learn. Exactly. And that's important. And that was one of those like, oh, fuck, I can't refute that. That yeah. is irrefutable. Well, like, it, yeah. yeah. It's, I don't it, want to do trig, but this process of learning trigonometry will benefit me in the future. 100%. And that's that's one of the things I didn't feel like I understood until actually post high school that yeah. I didn't know how to learn because mm -hmm. everybody's different. And mm -hmm. I'm also riddled with like ADHD and mm -hmm. like all that stuff. So like sitting in a classroom was torture for me. Yeah. You know, and I was just always daydreaming about playing music and, and doing, it paid off. Yeah, doing stuff. And now in two days, you're heading off on a headline and run. Uh, you guys have headlined before, obviously, in small shows, but this Regionally, is the yeah. biggest full national headliner, or first national yeah, headliner. Yeah, the first one. Uh, I was looking at ticket sales, and you said regionally. The whole Northeast is sold out, which to me is the coolest, like, yeah, uh, yeah cool start to the run. I think it's five-ish shows that you have sold out right to start. I mean, that's got to be the biggest pat on the back of like, yeah, we're talking about record record numbers or record tweets of people saying it. It's like, that can get in your head, but sold out is undeniable. That is a, a red tag on the poster. That's a, yeah, a pat on the back that you can't can't avoid. And it's got to be incredible to look ahead to. Oh, yeah. There, it's definitely like the check on the the life goals yeah. to be able to do. I was actually really surprised that Toronto was the first show to sell out. Was it? Cool. Yeah. The, uh, those lovely Canadians. <laughs> That's cool. It's cool just to yeah, see how it's grown. And yeah, I saw Philadelphia was selling out and it was cool to kind of see the, the support as a Connecticut nucleus, but that it's slowly branched out. And it's yeah, cool to imagine that continuing to grow through the country. Uh, what does it feel like to be, yeah, now a couple days ahead of that first headlining run? So it's, yeah, now you are the, I don't know, I think headlining is an interesting thing where it's the glamorous thing, but it's also the hardest in that now you're the ones having to sell tickets. You're the ones who are the final say on these people's nights. Like there's a lot of pressures that aren't necessarily there otherwise. Mm -hmm. So even though it's the same thing, it's kind of not the same thing in a way. And is that yeah. fair? Is that accurate? Yeah, it's it's pretty accurate. It, I mean, there's, there's a level of... Uh, obligation that i feel to the fans regardless of where if we're headlining or not you know there's you know people have school people have work people mm -hmm. you know have kids that you know this is their date night in their you know yeah. they're like I, my thing is like i want to perf like perform and give them the best show as humanly possible there's been mm -hmm. times where i'm playing and my head feels like it's about to explode because i have a headache because i haven't drank enough water i didn't mm -hmm. sleep and you know, I like I could feel myself like tapering off, and I was like, and I, I like talk shit to myself and be yeah. like, "Don't you let these people down!" And then it's like go full force back mm -hmm. again. Um, Do you find like a specific person in the crowd, or is it just the idea of the crowd? Um, so I mean, it's sometimes it's different every night. You, you, usually, like there is like one nut in particular that mm -hmm. you're like, oh, "Okay, that it it definitely helps." Uh, a lot of the times people just kind of melt together though. Cause mm -hmm. if not too, you'll see like the one person with their arms of crossed yeah, yeah. and you'll be like, comment. well, why aren't you having fun? <laughs> yep. Or, but sometimes they do sometimes like you can't let that get in your head because mm -hmm. sometimes they'll come up to the, it, up to me afterwards and they'll be like, that was the greatest thing I've ever mm -hmm. seen in my life. And I'd be like, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had a weird way of showing it, but yeah. it was internalized somehow. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, there's, I think, for the most part, things are kind of mu like pretty much the same, except you know everything is on our terms now, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's kind of falls in like if anything, like any of the opening bands are going to be like, "What time do you guys want us here?" Like there, there's just kind of more responsibility on that end for I us. Didn't think about those details. Yeah. yeah, and you know, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, you know, we've been on tours where. Like, it's hard to say, like, there's never been, I, don't, I can't think of, like, a single band that, like, is, was, like, mean or, mm -hmm. like, not, like, you know, there's definitely bands that are less outgoing, but, like, you see that, like, in people, too, mm -hmm. uh, where just, you're just, they're just kind of very, like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Ultimately, your coworkers on tour. And, yeah, Essentially, kind of the but then there. there's other bands that really go above and beyond to make you feel comfortable mm -hmm. and to, like, have, like, a good time. Like, we just did this last run with uh, Kill Switch Engage, and so they, cool. were, they were, like, 8 o'clock, me in our green room, we're having beers. And Hell it yeah. was just, like, oh, like, this is awesome. Hell like, yeah. you know, just to kind of have, like, it's one of those things that's like, okay, if that band can do it, anybody can do it. I love that idea. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and there's just like, you know, it's a little bit more uh, like to do on our agenda. Like we got VIPs and stuff. And now mm-hmm. we have to, we, we have like a lighting rig and stuff. So we're at, we, which we're getting tomorrow and we have to figure out how to Jesus. get it to work <laughs> and like put it together. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny how uh, to be at this level and still kind of be like, hey, how are we going to set up these lights? And people will be like, oh. And be like, all right, let's figure it out. <laughs> let's uh-huh, figure I it that. out. Um, I love that. I'm glad you're yeah willing to talk about it because, yeah, I feel like so much of this scene is held together by duct tape in one way or another. Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. That's a, not literal duct tape is getting a lighting rig, but it is some version of like, yeah, when people are on stage whatever Friday night when they're seeing you, they're going to assume there's a lighting director who spent a month figuring that out. Yeah. And it's like, kind of, maybe, but there's also a couple of us three days ago saying, well, where does this plug in? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. And then like 10 minutes before the set starts and like mm-hmm. something's not working and you're just like, yeah. what's, what am I going to do? Do you guys all take care of that? Or is there someone who's more in charge of that? Than- um, there's different aspects of things that people like get a little bit like take charge of. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like we, it, it's hard to say for every band because every band kind of works differently. Of course, yeah. But uh, we're pretty good about like delegating out responsibilities yeah. and like people just kind of step up and like take charge of certain things like within skill sets. So be like, I know I'm better at this. So I'm going to just like, I'm going to do this or Matt will do that. Ryan does this. Chris does that. Like, you know, Ryan does this. Um, We're talking a lot about all this stuff off the stage. I think it's interesting. We're talking about a touring concert. That's an hour on stage. And most of what we're talking about is the other 23 hours of the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it fair to say the hour on stage is the best and easiest part and everything else is the work part or is the on stage part still work, but it's just yeah harder to recognize as work. It's definitely harder to recognize as work. Uh, yeah, it, that's an interesting thing because like even you know even the hardest parts of the job are still like you know like we're not out there you know putting pavement down in the mm-hmm. hot sun. Yep. You know, they, of, of course there's like a lot of sacrifice and playing a song at quarter speed sucks. Like, yeah. I don't need you. Yeah. It yeah, sucks but, yeah, yeah. But at the end of the but day, it's, it's just like, than playing yeah, pavement. Yeah. you know, I, yeah. it, I, I guess that just comes from me being grateful because I did do all that stuff for a really long time. I have literally been working outside since mm-hmm. I was like 10 years old, you yep. know, or Hispanic. My dad <laughs> owned a landscaping company. I started yeah. working when I was six years old. Like, yeah. <laughs> like I, so one of the, like the biggest thing for me was just be like, all right, I'm going to do everything humanly possible. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to, you know, I don't end up with a shovel in my hand yep. and it's not to put that down. And it's like, you know, it's important. And it's just, for me, I was like, I did it for so long. Yep. I just, and you know, immigrant family coming here. It's like, let's take this to the next level. How can I give my, if I have kids, if I mm-hmm. like, how can I set them up to be, you know, let's take over. Yeah. And of course, if dad has a landscaping company, I'm assuming that that is an achievement for him to own the company instead of being a laborer. So it's a, a way to continue that growth that it's already been made. It's a way to continue the family name in a way that's, yeah, not in a, someone's front yard, oh, but in a way that extends you know, that legacy. Like that's, that's the American dream right there. Like mm-hmm. he came over here with nothing mm-hmm. and, you know, started his own business started a family, bought a Mm -hmm. home, like, you know, that's pretty wild to me. And then just one generation, he's got a kid that, well, he's got a few kids, (laughs) but you know, my brother and I both work in the music industry and uh, we're both kind of just like, you know, trying to take, take it, take it by storm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think in the, the moment the storm is happening, it's an exciting moment, but you mentioned that, yeah, bef- there's a lot of time before this where the storm wasn't quite as exciting. No, no, it, there, no, no, no storm. Uh, it was a, it was a, a light drizzle. Uh, the <laughs> one note I had here is I know you were with lines lines for a while yeah. uh, is where I kind of met you or where you know, my first awareness of you is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know in 2017, I found online that you guys were in the UK. You went to Europe mm-hmm. with lines lines. So I guess I didn't realize my understanding is that you were kind of in the local area for a while. And then currents was like your first time traveling and seeing the world i didn't realize that yeah in 2017 at some point you'd already seen some of the world oh yeah when does like traveling and touring start like how old are you when you first get in a van and go make that happen uh well so it was literally right after high school is when i started like when i joined lions lions Mm -hmm. and it was my first professional band okay um, so you've done garages and oh yeah i mean like, i started playing shows when i was like 14 like 13 14 oh, yeah, okay. and uh like that's when i met 
like the original Currents guys. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I remember, you know, back at the heirloom, back at the air. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, the first time I met them was at the max. Okay. You ever, had you ever me. been there? No, I don't think so. Yeah. I think it was no. in uh, new Milford. Hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. A long time ago, but yeah, was, I never even know. heard of that. It was before me. Oh yeah. So like that, I remember like, you know, hearing the first current recorded current song ever mm-hmm. in Patrizio's dorm room and being like, this yeah. band's going to be huge. <laughs> That's and, cool. You know, is is it's just wild the way that works. But mm-hmm. yeah, so I uh I it was kind of an interesting story about how uh like my music career got started because it, it almost feels like a movie. Mm-hmm. Um I feel like I've been very lucky in a sense to be I mean, when when people say luck, I kind of luck is when preparation and opportunity meet. You know, so of course, like putting in all those hours of like, mm-hmm. you know, playing shows and doing and practicing and doing things like that mm-hmm. was uh, like preemptively preparing me for what was to come. But, you know, I I got kicked out of high school um, and there was a point where, you know, I was, I was in like a rocky relationship, like I didn't have a job, like I kind of felt like a the biggest loser, Mm -hmm. you know? And my friend, uh, my friend Alan was just like, you need to get out of the house. Like, let's go to a show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I I just not feeling it. Yeah. Yeah, Like I'm I'm depressed. (laughs) Let me be depressed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he was just like, no, you're coming to the show. And, uh, it was a lion's lion show. And like, especially in high school, they were like my favorite band, you know? And we went to the show, ended up having a really good time. And I saw Isaac, their guitar player, like just standing outside. He was like smoking a cigarette or something. And I walked up to him and just like any like buddy, just, you know, you know the way we met and be like, hey, man, it was a great set. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, he's like, oh, thank you, man. It was really cool, cool, cool. And we like talked for like a second. And then he goes, yo, he's like, I see you at like every show. And I was like, yeah, you guys are like my favorite band. Like, I love shows. I love music. I try to come out to all the shows. And he's like, cool, cool, cool. And he's like, you, you you play guitar, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, cool. Um, he's like, you have a job? And I was like, nah. And he's like, you, you go to school? And I was like, nah. And he was like, okay, cool. He's like, you want to go on tour? <laughs> Just like that. Where are you as he's asking your quest as he's asking you these questions, where is your head going? Are you just like confused at what I was the fuck confused he's talking about? As hell. Yeah. I was just yeah. like, where the hell is this going? <laughs> just some weird guy wants to be my friend. I guess this is well, friendly. Yeah. That like it, it, it like knowing him now, it's mm-hmm. so like it makes sense yep. that he just went up to some <laughs> random kid and yeah. like it was like this is gonna work. Yep. And I was like, okay. Um I was like, yeah. I've always wanted to go on tour. And he was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, we leave next week. Cause like the show was like on a Friday or a Saturday and they yeah. left like the next Thursday or Friday. I was like, okay. And then I didn't hear from him from like, I gave him my number and stuff. And then I didn't hear from him from like three days. And I was like, oh man, like that sucks. Maybe he was just fucking with me. Like, yeah. like whatever. And then I get a, I get a call from him and he's just like, Hey man, like, you know, we're going to practice on Wednesday. Uh, like these are the songs, like if you could learn them and come up, like that'd be awesome. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And then did you I, know this? Like at that point, you're I, a fan of the band. So I, you kind of know the I songs. Kind of, like I knew the songs. Mm-hmm. I didn't know exactly how to play them, but I spent like a couple of days like mm-hmm. figuring it out. Yeah. And, um, you know, like on what I got in my, my little Jetta and uh, <laughs> that was like falling apart. And I, I drove up to Providence, Rhode Island and I practiced for two days with them. And they were like, all right, let's go. And then I went on my first tour ever. How which, long was that tour? Um, I think it was like about a month. Damn. Uh, and it was crazy. So I ended up meeting a lot of people that I'm still friends with to this day. Uh, I'm like, so we were playing with a band called City Lights, which was members that eventually made up Beartooth and like Moths of Flames. So it's like, it's kind of crazy how everything like (laughs) turned out. And then, uh, yeah, I played like, I went and played my first festival. I met, it's like. I met a bunch of people out there. I'd known, I'd like met Swarnin and stuff from playing mm-hmm. show, them playing around here and, mm-hmm. and all that. So they saw me out in Texas and were like, dude, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm playing music. <laughs> That's uh, crazy. So like, that was cool. And like, I got to see some of like my favorite bands. Like, you know, I was like, I'm playing, I was like, pl- yeah. we played with Glass Draw and shit like mm-hmm. that. And I was just like, this is nutty. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then, but I was, just, so I was just filling in for that tour. And then, uh, like a couple months later, 
uh, their their bass player Johnny ended up like leaving the band, and like I didn't play bass before, you know, and they were like. They were on tour with Sleeping with Sirens, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And they were like, "Hey, like Johnny quit the band. He like like in an emergency. Can you play bass and come out and do this?" And I was like, "I've mm-hmm. never played bass before, but mm-hmm. like I knew the song, so yeah. I, could, I could figure it out." Yeah, you know. And then just like after that, it just everything kind of snowballed from there. That's cool. And uh, my brother ended up playing drums in the band for a bit too, and uh, that's where we learned a lot uh, of our like skills as far as like touring skills go yeah. and he right after that uh ended up being like tm for currents mm-hmm. so like a lot of the stuff that we learned from like the lines lines camp he brought to currents and they would like when they that's when their journey with like the touring and that grind started that's interesting so that when you um in the football context like they sign the offensive coordinator from college to the nfl team so that when the quarterback arrives the nfl team he has the playbook still in exactly. mind and the same kind of thing exactly talking about, yeah with josh yeah. bringing the kind of the tour rhetoric the tour strategy to currents is that when you finally get there it's like oh this feels like home this feels like a 100 i'm aware of yeah that's yeah interesting. It's, it was it was easy and that's how josh ended up getting into his career now mm-hmm. in the management side because he manages like us he manages mm-hmm. uh invent he manages like kublai khan and just like has like a bunch of stuff with um with our other manager scott mm-hmm. uh so yeah, it, it's it's sometimes like looking back on That's everything crazy... and seeing the way that things worked out mm-hmm. is wild. The serendipitousness, and I think I uh, I like to fall back on the idea of like even if the the lines lines vocalist hadn't given you that bizarre opportunity, even that hadn't worked out, like probably at some point a year down the line, there's some other road that takes you where you're going to be now. Like it's not like you never make it to stage without that conversation. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, it is like, damn, how many of those conversations have we had and just never thought about? Like, who have you talked to? And this is a rhetorical question, but like, who have you talked to at a show that just walked away with a t-shirt and now currently they're sitting somewhere with a t-shirt on their wall playing a song in one quarter speed learning and in 10 years they'll be on the stage doing it? I hope so. Like, it's, it's a really weird butterfly effect that well, we're always playing with. Well, one of the weird things too is like uh, kids that are like 18 now. Mm-hmm. That will like message me being like, you were the first band that I listened to in like the seventh grade. Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and because you think about it from like, you know, even just like say high school, mm-hmm. you know, how old are you when you get into high school? Like 13, 14? Something, yeah. Like 13, 14. Ages 13 to 18 are such incredible years of growth for a person. Yeah. And yeah. within like the four years of, you know, you know, people listening to like the place I feel safest during mm-hmm. that time, or like you know, I let the devil in. Mm-hmm. Like these kids essentially grew up with this music, yeah, and it's such a big part of their life. And it's kind of it like reminds me of like back in that time of like the bands too. Like you know, I remember in like high school when like the Devil Wears Prada of like first dropped. Like there's there's some of their bangers and being yeah. like this that was such a huge part of my life. Mm-hmm. And to kind of see like kind of look in the rear like view mirror and be like, Oh, I'm doing the same thing for somebody else, which yeah. is like, is pretty cool. Like I like that. I've, uh, I've had the same idea and I've liked the idea of meeting your heroes. And we always hear, don't meet your heroes. Cause they're always dickheads. And, uh, I've enjoyed that. I don't think that's true. I think usually when I've met them. I've appreciated that they're human. And then when I see them on stage, it's like, I just saw you 10 minutes ago and you're depressed and hung over and pissed off. And now you're up there being happy and giving us all this energy when I know you don't have it. And so in some sense, I've enjoyed meeting my heroes because it does humanize them. I think you're in a strange spot where you've now met your heroes. You've played shows with them. You've drank beers with them at the bar. Like, how has that been as a, as that 18 year old kid who grew up in whatever bands and now you're rubbing elbows with these people. Like it's, it's cool. And I'm, I'm not asking you to tell me the, who the person was that was a bad example of that. But I mean, yeah, it must just be a kind of surreal thing to be playing shows with kill switch. And oh, yeah. yeah, I walk off stage and they're walking on next. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Like just the fact that before their set, like they'd come out and just watch us, mm-hmm. and, you know, like they're just enjoying the show and like, that's huge that's so for me. Weird, yeah. It's like, it, it's them continuing to do that inspirational thing that they did for me as a young kid. That's cool. Now. And it, it's not just them. Like uh, there's so many cool people, anybody that isn't cool. Like I don't even remember them mm-hmm. now. Cause yeah. like, you know, they, 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 I don't know. Just some people don't stick like that, but yeah. like definitely a lot of the people. Like an, another good one is uh, Cove mm-hmm. uh, from Dead American. Okay, uh, he was you know the vocalist of Seosin, like post Anthony Green, which like that self titled Beatle record is one of my 
all-time favorite records. Awesome. And he's such a sweet... He, like, messages me a happy birthday every year. And That's incredible. Like, like, <laughs> like, every time I go, like, don't cry. <laughs> like, it's just, like, oh, ha- yeah. like, I try not to fangirl all the time. Are it, there other ones that stand out from all the festivals and all the bands you've played with over the years? Are there... Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a ton, like, there's a lot of people that are nice and stuff. I, I feel like, you know, people have bad days. Of you course. know, some people are more uh introverted than mm-hmm. others um you know like bad omens is a good example of like a band that's incredibly nice and like they're all really cool people but some of the members are really like introverted mm-hmm. and some of the members are really extroverts yep. and stuff like yeah. that yeah. you know like you know uh like noah takes a little bit to warm up to mm-hmm. but like when he does you're like oh he's just trying not to have a panic attack right yeah. now like he's yeah. a sweetheart yep. you know where like the first day that we we we're on tour with them. Nick was like in our trailer being like, be like I really want to be friends. And we were like, we want to be friends too. <laughs> oh yeah. That's funny. That's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Just the, the human side of it that I think we always forget about. Uh, but it's like, yeah, you are on stage. Uh, you mentioned earlier, there's a night when you or not a specific night, but there are moments obviously around stage and feeling short of a hundred percent for whatever reason. Uh, and I had one of those this week where I'm filming, uh, I was at a college filming like their spring concert or whatever, filming the recap of it. And it's one of those where I'm looking around and everyone's excited to be here and I just want to go home. Like it's this gorgeous day outside and it's beautiful. Like there's no reason for anything not to be going well, but I'm just in my head and it's just one of those days of like, I'll get through it. I'll do the thing. Uh, How do you find comfort in those moments? So for me, the strategy is to try and find someone uh, you mentioned like looking at the crowd to me, it's find that one person in the crowd who is having that euphoric experience. And it's like, okay, I'll, I remember when I was you, let me just, live through that energy for a little bit how are you processing those moments where you're on stage and yeah your head just isn't isn't there well it's kind of like what i was talking about before of like the way Mm -hmm. and i i kind of those those places like in my head that i start to get to is kind of like similar to like when i'm exercising and Mm -hmm. i don't want to be there but you're just it just kind of (laughs) like like you know your inner bitch Mm -hmm. and you just like slap it and be like no, yeah. like we're doing this. Yep. And it, it doesn't happen often, mm-hmm. but like uh, the last day of our Europe, our last Europe tour, you know, we had just gotten off of a full US tour, a full Australian tour, and then a full European tour back mm-hmm. to back to back. Yeah. And it was the last show. And I, in my, like going into it, I was just like, I don't want, like, I don't want to do this. Like, yeah, yeah. and I felt so bad, but yeah. like in, in my head, I'm like, you owe it to these people mm-hmm. that came to see you. Yeah. And more than that, you owe it to your 16 year old self who would never have dreamed this was possible. Oh yeah. yeah. The, well, I mean, it's all I daydream. The, it's crazy. There's, there's been times where I remember being like a little kid, like 10 years old, mm-hmm. learning how to play guitar and I'd be daydreaming and looking at my carpet. It's just, I remember this specifically. It's just like looking at my carpet and you seeing like all the little colors, mm-hmm. like like the different patterns, like in the whatever, like the carpet yeah, yeah. bristles. Yeah. And like imagining them being like people. That's interesting. And I, like, there's been times where like I played like where we were playing and there's a sea of people and like I'm getting flashbacks of those moments. Oh, that's where really I'm, like, cool. This is what I was like almost manifesting mm-hmm. at 10 years old like, happening now. That's so cool. Uh, the one other tangent, kind of going, I'm going back a couple of minutes here. Uh, you mentioned how some people are harder to warm up and how it's, yeah, the, the person we see on stage isn't always the person who you meet in the green room. Uh, and I've always stuck with the story of, uh, Mitch Lucker, the suicide silence vocalist who's yeah, rest in peace now deceased. Um, uh, but there was an interview with him where he was talking about his social anxiety and how he, this conversation is impossible for him. But once he gets on stage and has the mic, he can talk in that sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that was interesting of the, the sense of like, uh, yeah, if someone who's kind of shy in the green room gets to go on stage and be that big personality. I think it's interesting that we overestimate them sometimes uh, and that as we're up there, it's like, yeah, they're all just human and as someone uh, like Bad Omens who is taking over the world, it's interesting mm-hmm. to imagine that someone in that camp could still be kind of shy and nervous and reserved uh, on on the current front of it. Is it still like, is it still fun? Like a, there's a point of yeah, I guess it's still fun, and there seems, seems to be like a point of success where it, there are just so many people who want a piece of you that it's hard mm-hmm. to have fun in it anymore. Do you still feel like, do you still feel like you're in the, like the sweet spot where it is fun, where you have fans, but it's not a part that's like I just can't even be Chris anymore. It, it's that's an interesting way to like look at it, and I've always I've always kind of viewed it as 
like I'm a big comic book fan, mm-hmm. and Batman's my favorite character. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, like in the comics, like he always described himself as like Bruce Wayne is the mask, Batman is who he is. Cool. Okay. And it's kind of how I feel like when I'm on stage, mm-hmm. uh, where it's just like this is who I am. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Interesting. Um, you know, and it, there, there's a weird sense of like transformation that you mm-hmm. feel like getting on stage and like when the lights go out and you hear like, I'll get, I'll give myself chills, like thinking about it. Like even, uh, during like the pandemic, like there's just like, sometimes like I would just like kind of close my eyes and you know, when it, like you just like hold your hand up mm-hmm. and like, just cause you do that on stage yeah. and you just hear hundreds of people just be like, ah, mm-hmm. like it's, it's, it's feels so powerful. Mm-hmm. And like Mike Tyson would talk about that, like uh, pre fights. He's a fascinating person to hear talk about his glory years. Yeah. Oh, for sure. He'd be like, I was, I was crying in the locker mm-hmm. room, and but just like every step he took towards the ring, like he would be like, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man, and he's like, nobody could beat me, I'm the man. And then by mm-hmm. he's like, by the time I got in the ring, I was a like, god. And it's kind that. of like a similar, it's kind of a similar feeling. The only piece of like giving to, like giving so much of yourself to people. The only time I ever actually like the only negative piece of that that I feel ever is sometimes when I give I feel like I give so much like I'll spend hours at the merch table just yeah. talking to people. Yeah. And didn't eat dinner, didn't have water. Yeah, <laughs> but I was like I can I can, I can get that after. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that part doesn't that part that literally doesn't bother me at all. all. Right. It's it's why like I it's what I'm here for. Like I like talking to people, I like meeting people. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I do feel guilty being like like, oh, I, I give so much of myself to these people. And I'm like, I haven't, like, called my mom in, like, a week. Yeah. Or, like, I haven't talked to my sister in a couple, like, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's just, like, be like, oh, I should be more present for, like, you know, people that, like, That's love me that yeah. aren't, like, benefiting my career in a way, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. That's an interesting. Uh, and the sports analogy, I think it was Jerry Rice. I'm forgetting. It was an NFL wide receiver. I'm forgetting which one it was. But one of the all-time greats. Sorry. Oh, no worries at all. Go take care of that. Yeah. Um, Jerry Rice at some point told a story of like how he would line up at the line of scrimmage and be terrified of knowing he's going across the middle and there's a middle linebacker waiting to take his head off. Mm -hmm. And his thing was like, I just had to know that whatever I was running away from was scarier than whatever I was running into. Mm -hmm. So the the trauma of his past and all the hard work, like he's running away from all that stuff. And that's scarier than whatever he's going into. And I'm hearing you kind of say the same thing of stage of like, the stage is scary, but it's way easier than dealing with all like going through all the hard work of practice and all the, um, the what's the correct word here? Uh, all the, the trauma. It sounds like you left out of high school where it's like, this was just a dog shit part of my life. And I'm mm. working away from that. And it's scary to go on stage. It's scary to deal with some of these things are hard to sometimes be present and feel like I'm not giving my family enough, but I, that is an easier option than going back to wherever I came from. Oh, that, I mean, you just nailed it right I, I, there. Yeah, like, it's always, I, you know, there's so much of that where like touring and being on stage is an escape to me. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, once, once you get home, you kind of faced with reality. Yeah. Of, you're like, oh, okay, I've been ignoring this aspects of my life for months now. Mm-hmm. Now I kind of have to deal with it, which can be more overwhelming because, you know, it's, you know, you're building a dam emotionally in one area of your life and you're not allowing things to flow Uh, because it's easy to just ignore things. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm on tour. Like, you know, like I don't, you know, there's, there's tons of that, but I mean, it's all growing. It's all learning, you know, because eventually you le- you let things back up too much they're going to blow it's mm-hmm. going to blow and at this point you've been on the road for long enough that i'm sure you've figured out a lot of those tricks of the trade so to speak uh, at this point it feels like you've been all over the world you've played with a lot of the bands like what is still exciting to you what do you look forward to what is the next the next milestone the next thing that gets you out of bed um well it's definitely tr- like seeing how far we could take this yeah you know there's always look milestones and goals to hit um you know, I, it just doesn't get old to me. Like it just hasn't gotten old to me. I, you know, I grew up in this Mm -hmm. and you know, it's kind of one of those things where I feel like if I like I was going to get sick of it, I would have already by now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just a wild ride. My, my ultimate goal, like my goal was never to be like famous or like rich or Mm -hmm. like anything like that is like, my goal was always to just like 
have as much fun and enjoy life as possible. Mm -hmm. And one of a way that, that, um, applies to my goals here is one of the things that I've always wanted to do is I've wanted to, to like create as many jobs as possible for my friends That's awesome. so that yep. they can quit their shitty jobs mm-hmm. and be like, just come work for me. Just yep. like come do merch, mm-hmm. come, you know, like, you know, like Sarah, for instance, like Sarah was able to like quit her, um, her brewery job mm-hmm. and like come do photography for us full time. And I love that. Yeah. You know, I, in, 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 in a way, it's kind of selfish because it adds to me having fun. Yeah. But no, I have the same thing. I uh, when I have video sets, it's like I, it's me, and I'm hiring usually a photographer. Someone else helps like a PA. But if I can give one of my buddies a hundred bucks just to come carry a box for the day, like for sure. I, it's like, dude, that makes me so happy. And it's for me, like I don't know if the hundred bucks matters to them, but the idea of like. Yeah, you can take a day off of the mall. You don't have to go to the mall. Just come here, carry these fucking couple things. Give me ten minutes of work, and I'll give you a hundred bucks if you hang out for Absolutely. the day and pretend you were doing something. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a yeah a value there of being able to give the same gift that we feel like we've been given. Where for me, it's the camera, and I think and I and I'm sure you would say the same thing with base, where it feels like no one gave it to you, but on some sense, someone did. Like for me, someone hired me, someone bought your ticket, like, and it feels like we earned it in the sense of, yeah, I remember all the times that no one gave a fuck about what I was doing, all the songs you played that no one heard. Mm -hmm. Um, But someone did have to give me that. There was some world that had to support what I was doing, and the more we can kind of pay that forward, I think is an exciting exciting thing to be able to take care of. 100%. It's the opportunities, just giving people like the opportunity to, you know, show what they could do, that Mm -hmm. they can add value to like something special that you're doing. Absolutely. You mentioned a uh, brewery and it reminded me, I skipped right over the uh, release week parties. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the record, we had the party at the coffee shop and party at the brewery. Mm-hmm. How did those go? I thought those were so sick. Those were so un- like, I was almost like, that was one of the most nerve wracking things for me. Cause, Interesting. Cause like, we're not playing. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, oh, they're they're just gonna be there to hang out. And I was so surprised like, yeah. it, like yesterday. Well, it was cause it's so fresh. Uh, yesterday the coffee shop there was a line like around the block that's incredible I, I, we were just like really like and this is the same as supporting businesses too right that's a coffee shop who oh, wouldn't yeah, have had sure. that many clients yeah that I mean that's also like I live right down the street from that coffee. Oh, yeah. I'm there every day <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like, that's my spot <laughs> and uh, you know those people there are so kind <clears throat> it's just so much of like everything is just like being shown kindness like how can I give that back yeah and I, I loved those events as is, I've always gotten a sense that Currents is just a community-centered band. I think there's a, a trope of a band who comes from a state like Connecticut and outgrows Connecticut and says, fuck Connecticut, fuck all this. I'm not doing this small town shit. Mm-hmm. And I like those as a way to yeah reconnect with fans. And it's like playing the Underground or playing the Webster is a version of that. Mm-hmm. But there's money exchange. There is some business. And for you guys to just say, no, no tickets, no business. Like we just come say hi. Yeah. I thought it was a really beautiful thing and a kind of a beautiful way to celebrate the record before you go see the country. Is like, yeah, let's get a good almost send off kind of thing going on here. Yeah, it's it's cool. Is everybody was so sweet. People brought their kids. Like, That's awesome. You know, and I I don't I don't know. It's it's especially like with Connecticut. I mean, I don't know how long. Exactly, like I just how long you've been like in the scene and stuff. But I remember when I first started, things were so clicky Mm -hmm. and very like. (laughs) I come in the scene. (laughs) Sorry, I come in when Half Hearted and Set Sail Sunrise are having like their war. So my first memory is like, yeah, the Break Deep era and whatever. So yeah, I'm one hundred (laughs) percent. Well, I mean, so it's it's one of those things where it's like there was so much beef between bands all the time, and people were like talk shit Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And but then like you find your core group of people that you know were in it for the right reasons and didn't Mm -hmm. care about that and everybody that's in currents is one of those people yep like we all grew up playing in connecticut we all Mm -hmm. had our separate bands Mm -hmm. you know anybody that didn't like want it or wasn't in it for the right reasons ended up leaving Mm -hmm. and then we came together because we were like oh like we're the same Mm -hmm. and it's it's like that all throughout the community and it's one of those things is like we're only going to create better things together mm-hmm. you know like you know you like you know bringing your elements to things enhances our show as well mm-hmm. and just building that community there there's such like a like a famine mentality when it comes to like there's only enough fans for like some of us like yeah. Well, that's not true at, not all. at all. And yeah. I, I love like, like the brotherhood feeling that like we have with so many of 
the bands that we've toured up with uh, like throughout the years, like Silent Planet and Fit mm-hmm. for a King, Invent, like there's so many of these people that we've made these like genuine connections with yeah. that I feel like, you know, they must have had a similar thing growing up where they're like, oh, you guys, like there's a, you, the real recognizes the real mm-hmm. and we're able to kind of like come together and like figure that out. Even like bands that from like, um, like Crystal Lake, they're from a whole other part of the world. Yeah. And, but there's this connection that we have, mm-hmm. you know, like. That's interesting. Yeah. It's like some of them, like Max, their, their bass player, like, you know, his English wasn't as great. Um, as like Rio's, but he and I had like some deep conversations mm-hmm. and like, you know, and seeing like how crazy it is that you can literally be as far away as you can and the similarities in how we grew up or how different we grew up, whichever way, like mm-hmm. in both aspects of it, but like those human connections and to be able to build a better relationship with those people. Cause like, you know, if I, if we're going to be all standoffish, and it makes the the tour feel weird, mm-hmm. you know, like for, oh, Crystal Lake, like whatever. <laughs> like, but even though they're smashing, they'll be like catering they, from three they, to three thirty, and we can't go until yeah, they're done. Yeah, they they they, they open the tour, yeah. and like some people will either look at that and be like, "Holy shit, how are we gonna follow that up?" Or they could be like, you know, "I would get excited and yeah. be like, I can't wait to yeah. go on now." You know, and yeah. it's just like to build that up because it, it could really ruin your experience if you can't mm-hmm. let your ego go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, on the same note, I think when Currents has success, I mean, Dreamwake just sold out the Webster and that's yeah. a testament to all of their hard work. I don't want to undermine that, but that is also Currents is paving away and saying, hey, this is possible. And um, yeah, I'm not aware of whoever was before Currents, but I'm sure someone else in Connecticut did something that, mm-hmm. yeah, encouraged the Webster to nurture Currents and allow this whole thing to grow. And it's, yeah, fun to watch that circle continue to kind of feed itself. Uh, and I think it's cool that, yeah, you're finding guys from Japan and uh, wherever else. I'm sure the, some, I don't know, invent All anime, someone's from Kentucky. Yeah, yeah mid- middle of the country, places yeah. that we never would have thought we'd cross paths with. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. We're getting towards an hour as we uh, move on here. I want to touch on jujitsu before I let you out of here. And Absolutely. so I'm, uh, I'm, I know you're a big fan of it, and I'm enamored with jujitsu as the idea of physical problem solving. I think it's this really fascinating way to, obviously, I'm, yeah repeating things I've heard from UFC and from Joe Rogan podcasts of quite the years. Uh, but it is an interesting thing. And I enjoy playing chess, which is a similar thing. And of course it's very different in that I'm not in any physical risk or any physical involvement. Um, but it is the idea of, uh, I get my ass kicked in chess by eight year olds mm-hmm. who I never would have looked at. And then I walk and I play someone who's a ner- who I think is a 50 year old nerd who should mop me. And it's like, Oh, no problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think jujitsu is a really beautiful, hum- humbling thing in the same sense. 100%. Uh, and that must be so valuable in music on the road when it's like, you don't always know who you're talking. You don't know who the promoter is. You don't know who the venue guy is. You don't know who this fan is. Like it, it demands a kindness and respect out of you and uh, enforces that like, you gotta be nice to everyone because there's a real physical reminder that you don't know who everyone is. Yeah. I mean, because especially too, when you start as a white belt, you just get smashed yeah. every day. <laughs> every day. And it, it, it takes a, it definitely takes a certain like a type of person that's willing to go in and fail. And keep showing when up. You, you, mm-hmm. Yeah, you keep showing up knowing you're going to fail. <laughs> yeah. But and then, you know, you just, just start noticing you're like, I fail a little bit less. Mm-hmm. And then a little bit less. I'm like, oh now I'm starting to actually. Or you gain know why success. you failed. Yeah. Exactly. I I didn't you know, I've been doing it since like I was a kid, but okay. uh like Six years ago is when I got like really dedicated to it, mm-hmm. you know, being like, oh, th- I want this to be a major part of my life. And it took me about like a year in to be like, to start being able to know enough to ask myself the que- like questions about uh, like, I-, I didn't even feel like I knew enough to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's-, it's interesting that you said like the chess stuff, because I've always like equated it to it's like. Imagine that like you're playing chess, but your opponent has the ability to move his pieces and yours. Yeah. yeah. And there's no turns. You're just going like this. Mm-hmm. Like trying it, to mess yeah. with everybody's yeah, yeah. stuff. It's an incredible way. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, just the, the possibilities and like the, the, like the growth 
in it is some it's it really similar to music to me where you see somebody and like there's people that they just grab you by the wrist mm -hmm. and it's like looking into a well that's endless yeah and you're like oh you just feel they, the <laughs> they know some shit <laughs> and you're, that's you're, funny, yeah. you're like and i'm about to feel all of that yeah and then but then sometimes i mean it's like sometimes you're the hammer, sometimes you're the nail. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's a great – again, and like more similarities, like the way you see it in everything. Uh, it's a great community, mm -hmm. great for people to like meet each other and for people to you – know, especially with something so physical like that is that's where you like gain trust with people. Yeah. If somebody's choking that's you. That's interesting, yeah. And you're, you're – like they're essentially – you're, when you tap, you're saying, hey, if you don't let go, you're going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And you have to trust them enough to say that they're going to let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or to not like rip your knee off or yeah. break your arm yeah, or something like that. I feel getting choked out is almost the least bad thing that could happen to you in a jiu-jitsu yeah, class. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> yeah. For sure. Uh, yeah, it depends. I don't know. I'm just thinking of all the knees and joints. It's like, I don't know. If you choke out, you, I'm sure, obviously, you die at a certain But usually, you come back. It's a couple seconds of whatever. But yeah, yeah. it's not a ligament It's definitely that not deal with. good for you. That's probably but, it, yeah. <laughs> but like, it's, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, less bad. Yeah, I don't it's know. less uh, bad. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm trying to think if Mike Tyson would argue that. Yeah, any head trauma is too much head trauma. Yeah, pretty um, much. But hell yeah, dude! Is that something you're able to stay active with on the road? I try to. Uh, I've met a lot of really cool people uh, that go to show. There's a lot of people that train now, mm -hmm. uh, so I know a lot of really cool like gyms that like I stop at like mm -hmm. here and there. That's um, gonna be fun. Yeah, That's like you know, there's a there's a lot of people that are very like. Uh, like welcoming to me. Mm -hmm. Like there's this guy in Ohio, his name is Emil and uh, he like opens up his gym just for me and like That's has so cool. people come out and like to, so I could train with them. And it's just so uh, it, it's, it's really nice. And uh, like, you know, to see the kind of love mm -hmm. in both, like they love music, they love jujitsu just like I do. And yeah. you know, and then they do that, and then, you know, I try, I guess, list them or, like, mm -hmm. give them T-shirts and stuff like that, you know. Just it's going to be really valuable as, like, a grounding experience, too, for the the bad days. Or I think the, the hard part of tour is that you just get in this insulated world where you're so sheltered from so much of the universe that's happening. And it, it's got to be such a valuable thing to, one, have a skill that you're working on that is totally not currents related. And also a place where it's like, yeah, I'm in Chicago. I'm going to just walk away from the tour package. I'm going to go wrestle. I don't know wrestling is the wrong term, but yeah, I'm going to go get physically active and just, yeah, let the physical stress out, but just think about something and do something that is not in this world. What it's got to be so valuable to, yeah, just keeping your head on straight as you're on the road for what, six, eight months a year at this point. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And even just, even just like kind of like exercising in general, cause it's yeah. so easy to like, yeah. People think that like touring is like all craziness all the time, but there's so much downtime yeah. and it's easy to get just like sit in the green room all so day, easy. sitting on your phone or your yeah. computer or playing video games. It's fun to sit in the green room all day. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but you know, so, yeah. like I, like I'll force myself, it's, like even if there's not a gym, like to go on runs and mm -hmm. stuff. And sometimes I think about that too. Cause when I go like on a run or something, uh, at a place like, you know, I can't go too far. So I usually mm -hmm. end up like finding like an area and mm -hmm. like running. And, uh, I go and like, I try, I try to do like three to five miles like every day, like, you know, mm -hmm. before the shows and stuff. And in doing that, I get like it, the area becomes so familiar where like there's places like That's in cool. Australia or Japan or in Europe that like, I could run that tr that mm -hmm. path in my mind to be like, oh, like this is where people live their everyday lives. That's and, cool. You know, it, it's pretty, it's interesting. But like if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have, like I wouldn't know the area as well as I do. That's cool. Yeah, I always hear the complaint of like, yeah, we were in London, but we didn't see anything. We just yeah. went to the show and then went to Manchester yeah, just, the next night. You just stay in, in, inside and like, that's just not me. Like yeah. I gotta go explore. And it shouldn't be. I think that's what a, what I'm repeating and what I've heard so many times that that's what kills you on tour is when you, all you're doing is playing shows and mm -hmm. by seeing the city and finding a favorite coffee shop or wrestling or wrestling jujitsu school to go train. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just opens up so much of the world for you and allows you to be be human on the road. Oh, one hundred percent. You you need all like all that and besides too like currents tours that so we could eat mm -hmm. like we're big foodies yeah. and that's like what we get most excited for. Mm -hmm. There's like a map. We're like oh we're gonna be in this city so that means we have this this and this That's to funny. choose from we have a lunch spot we have a dinner spot and <laughs> this is where the good milkshakes are <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so we do, there's a lot of that 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, everywhere's it's it's been it's a wild journey. Oh yeah, my man. Well, I appreciate you making time to come through. We we'll start yeah, start wrapping up here. Uh, we got the new record out. It's streaming everywhere. I'm sure everyone could find that. Uh, where can people find you? Where can they find yeah? What can they look for in the future? Uh, you can find me. All my socials are just like at Chris Pulgarin. Uh, and then follow the band. The band just started like a TikTok too. Hell yeah. Um, you know, I've been trying to get better with, uh, I got a GoPro. So we're mm-hmm. trying to do like more stuff and also talking about doing our own podcast from like in the van. Oh, that'd be sick. Yeah. That'd be so cool. So, uh, we're trying to put out as much content as possible. That's really smart. Uh, the mobile podcast is interesting. I've never heard of that. And I think it's a brilliant idea as a way to unpack and advertise all the cities you're going through. Like there's so many, mm. uh, hidden benefits in there. And of course, obviously I'm a fan of podcasting and conversation, so it's fun. But yeah, from a business, my brain is firing. It's like, wow, that's a brilliant business plan. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, I, I definitely, yeah. I've had a lot of ideas and uh, how to uh, get people more involved mm-hmm. like, and see the other aspects of not just. Yeah. So it's like one of the things is like people see us on stage and stuff and they're like, oh, they're so serious. But mm-hmm. like, we're just all a bunch of no. silly geese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Well, I appreciate you coming through. Um, awesome. Uh, I'd like to try and end on something fun. Uh, what city are you most excited for on tour? Ooh. Or I guess what restaurant is probably the best. <laughs> is uh, there a milkshake in Chicago that you're eager for or something? Uh, so there's a spot in Toronto called Antler. Okay. And I, so you say you like Joe Rogan. Uh, the owner of that spot was on his podcast because okay. uh, he's a, a, it's like a game restaurant. Okay. And so like he forges for like all the mushrooms and like all the stuff for himself, but like a bunch of vegans, uh, attacked his restaurant and Mm -hmm. then he butchered a deer in the window while they were protesting. (laughs) Uh, but besides the controversy, uh, I don't want, I don't need the vegan mobs coming at me. Uh, I like salad too. Uh, uh, it's like an incredible restaurant. That's cool. Yeah, like we all make it a point to go. That's cool. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. the whole experience. Sounds yeah. cool. Well, awesome, man. I appreciate you coming through. We'll keep chatting for a minute, but that'll end. I'll push the big record button.